Once again, we welcome you to Moving Forward with Young Voices. We're very happy to welcome Jacob Lane to the program. He is a Young Voices contributor. And Jacob, tell us a little bit about uh, who you are and what you do. Sure, uh, sure, Brian. Well, first off, thanks for having me on the show. Um, I like to say I'm the senior citizen in this Young Voices cohort because <laughs> I'm in my mid-30s. <laughs> so, but I still feel young, so that's all that matters. Uh, but I am a nonprofit consultant and I'm a political consultant. So what I do is, is I help nonprofits um, across the country with their fundraising and um, communications. And then I also help state and local candidates um, in Illinois. I'm originally from Illinois. Um, I left Illinois for a few years um, to go work out east. But, you know, home is where the heart is. And I was drawn back to the state. And um, I, so what I do here is I help state and local candidates who are looking to make a difference. And Lord knows in Illinois, we need all the help we can get right now. Oh, I bet. I bet you got your hands full. Now, this being an election year. There, of course, are, you know, there's there's a lot at play here. I'm looking at an article that, uh, that you wrote for the Daily Caller about uh, mm-hmm. the student student loan um, and, and debt forgiveness and so forth, how that may play into this election year, particularly as it pertains to younger voters. Set the stage for me. Um, I know the president tried to uh, cancel student loan debt and I think got slapped down by the Supreme Court once before, but he just did, again, he just offered relief on, yeah. on student loans, Correct. He sure did. Um, And you're exactly right. So his first attempt um, where he tried to wipe away uh, student loan debt uh, in the amounts of 10 to twenty thousand dollars, depending on income level for 43 million Americans, that was smacked down by the Supreme Court. So this is Biden's second go go around at this. And it's sort of befitting that we you know we just experienced Groundhog Day last week. This is Groundhog Day again. <laughs> the Biden administration. Where have we seen this? <laughs> um, <laughs> we've seen this before, and we're probably going to see a likely result. So what's different about this plan, though? So this is called the SAVE plan. And you know how Washington, D.C. loves to come up with these creative acronyms. Oh, yeah. um, and what SAVE stands for is Saving on a Valuable Education Plan. And this plan is available to most people who have taken out federal loans, and it's also available to future borrowers. Now, the the difference between this plan and what Biden did last time is that SAVE actually calculates a borrower's monthly payments based on a borrower's income and their family size. So if you have a lower income level or you have a large family, your payment level could basically be nothing. And after 10 years of payments, according to this plan, um, a borrower's remaining balance can basically get wiped away. But again, similar to what we saw in the first plan, there wasn't a single debate about this in in all the halls of Congress. The the Senate didn't take this up. The House of Representatives didn't take this up. What we see again is this, this is the Biden administration using unilateral action to wipe away loans. I mean, I, I remember hearing the saying growing up about, ah, sometimes it's easier to seek forgiveness than permission, but you don't like to see that on, on the executive level. And it sounds like that, well, that may be what he's doing. Well, exactly. And you have people from his own party. I mean, Nancy Pelosi famously said what, after Biden took office that he did not have the power to unilaterally wipe away loans, that Congress has the power of the purse. That's one of their, their many checks on the executive branch. And unfortunately, what you see right now is you're seeing Biden tanking among young voters. And so this is, for all for all exclusive purposes, an attempt to win back some of those voters who are a, a bit disenfranchised that his last student loan go around. It, it didn't it didn't go through. Interesting. Now, I I think it was just last week I was speaking with another Young Voices contributor about um, those those young people who would have student loans, or those who may be contemplating an education who could benefit from this. Nonetheless, their their vote is not a slam dunk. I mean, I can understand, hey, look at the favor that we're doing for you. But in your opinion, Jacob, is is it likely to move the needle with uh, with these younger voters? You know, I really, I really don't think it's going to, because if you look at poll after poll, young voters are really upset with the Biden administration for a number of different reasons. In particular, Biden scores really low marks for his handling of the Israel Hamas war amongst young voters. Young voters do not like the direction of what the Biden administration is doing right or wrong. They don't like it. 
Um, and it has turned off a lot of young people. And that also, too, I mean, you, 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 you know, a lot of young people are still dealing with inflation. They can't make their rent. They can't afford to live month to month. Um, a lot of young people are upset with how the Biden administration has handled um, the, the Roe v. Wade ruling from the Supreme Court. They think he should be doing a lot more to codify that into federal law. So, no, I, do, I don't think this is going to move the needle. And, and in particular, I think it's actually going to hurt him with those young voters that didn't go to college because why should they be forced to pick up the debt from someone who did for for, for, for something they obviously didn't get to have the privilege of, of, of doing? Yeah, it's. I have to wonder, too, if, um, I mean, Biden has certainly made his share of mistakes, but I wonder how many of those younger voters are, are thinking in terms of, you know, there's a vast amount of the, the whole federal apparatus that's not elected, but it stays in power and, and depends yep. on the whims of those in power. Um, I, I guess I've never, I've never traveled throughout the D.C. Beltway, but to my friends who have have said, you don't start to understand the scope of, of the federal government until you have driven past literally miles of you know, oh, fields and buildings well, and storage facilities. Well, and if you just look at the wealthiest counties in America, I think it's like the top 10 wealthiest counties. Four of them border D.C. There's there's a reason for that. Right. That That's not by accident. Um, so absolutely. So talk to me about uh, what other things are we likely to see, in your opinion, uh, as far as uh, trying to, to woo the voters? Now, certainly, you know, hey, I'll let you off from from some debt. That's a pretty attractive pitch. Are there are there other uh, other Lows <laughs> to which politicians will will try to, to garner somebody's vote. I'm just I'm just curious what else they may have on the table. You know, I mean, it, like I, I said, I think th- the save plan is is his. Like I said, the second attempt at at student loan forgiveness because it was such a key campaign flank in two in 2020 when he ran that he you know with he was going to take a magic wand and all of a sudden all your troubles would be gone and these loans would no longer be a problem for you Mm -hmm. um i do think you're you're going to see um I, i think you're going to see a lot of pandering from the Biden administration um, to certain segments uh, of their voters, um, because I, I look, they're scared. Republicans have not won the youth vote since Ronald Reagan in 1984. Um, and if, if Biden loses that segment and he's already losing other segments by big margins and, and, you know, we're talking about segments, look at what's happening with the Hispanic vote. He's in big trouble. Um, with Hispanics, and that's a big vo- uh, growing uh, voting block. So I think you're going to see a lot more pandering. Uh, I think it's going to be under the guise of, of uh, plans similar to the safe plan. But yeah, there's going to be a lot of pandering between now and uh, uh, the election. Jacob, one thing I really appreciated in your article is you you address something more than just the symptom that uh, you know the student debt uh, represents. You you address some of the root causes, in particular mm-hmm. the um, the rising costs of education, um, for that mm-hmm. matter, you know, the, the, the collusion that takes place between, you know, lending institutions and educational institutions to convince students, oh, you got to take on all this backbreaking debt, you know, that cannot be forgiven if you want to get a good education. Um, let's talk a little bit about, is there any move towards not having to forgive debt because people aren't going <laughs> so much into debt? Well, you know, that's that's the whole problem with the safe plan, right? Is that if if you provide these students student loan forgiveness, why would any college have an incentive to invest in more cost effective degrees? Um, they're just going to continue to raise the cost of tuition because they figure, well, hey, if you're going to give student loan forgiveness, why do I need to lower the cost of tuition? There's there's no need for it because the federal government's going to come in and bail you out. Um, and I I think what we need to start talking with young people is, is that, and I, I'm a unique case in this, is that there are cost effective ways for you to complete a degree. Now, they're not pretty. I'm not saying it's easy to get out of school debt free, right. but with a little calculation and a little planning, you can do that. Uh, for instance, I think really think we need to start talking up community colleges. I started at a community college. It was a great way for two years to save money. I got to live at home um, and I was able to transfer every single class I took at that community college to a four year liberal arts school. And I ended up getting a scholarship to go to that liberal arts school. 
school. So I, there are ways around student debt. I'm not saying that th- that everyone's going to graduate debt free because I understand circumstances are different for everyone, but it just it does take a little creativity. But if you look into alternative means, there are ways around taking out all that massive debt. Absolutely. And I I appreciate you sharing that. We're talking with Jacob Lane. He is a Young Voices contributor. Um, Jacob, I'd like to ask uh, when when we have guests such as yourself on the show, where can people find you? Where are you on social media? Sure. So um, I'm not antagonistic towards social media, uh, but I don't have a lot of it. Um, You can find me. I'm a regular contributor um, to Newsmax. I'm a Newsmax insider. So I write regularly uh, for that publication. So you can catch me on uh, Newsmax.com. um, and then you can also, I'm, I'm a big LinkedIn guy. I know that that's not popular. Uh, I know more guys with Twitter and, and um, uh, Facebook, but, uh, but you can catch me on LinkedIn. Uh, my, uh, my handle name is uh, Jacob P. Lane. Welcome back to Moving Forward with Young Voices. Happy to welcome Daniel Elmore to the program. Daniel's a Young Voices contributor. And uh, Daniel, take a moment here for the sake of people meeting you for the first time. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Sure. So I'm an economics major at a small university in North Carolina called Lenore Ryan. And I focus in economic policy as well as behavioral economics and a few other smaller fields. I'm looking at an article that uh, that you wrote for the Washington Examiner about the discrete erosion of U.S. household savings. And, you know, I, like everybody, I notice how much the cost of just everything we need month to month has gone up in the last couple of years. But I'll, I'll admit that is not something I've really stopped and evaluated. What's the significance of seeing household saving, U.S. household savings diminish? Sure. So what we've seen over the past few months and, well, frankly, the past few years is we saw a huge spike in savings during COVID when all those stimulus payments went out. However, since then, we've seen a rapid diminishment of those savings. And the and the reason that's important is because that is what's sustaining the Bidenomics economy as we're sitting currently. Okay, well, let's uh, let's let's take a moment and talk a little bit about uh, what's going on in terms of of like the rising costs. Can you, can you help us just get some perspective of what are we actually seeing in terms of what things cost? Uh, what are, what are we seeing in terms of household income? It sure doesn't feel like we're keeping up that, that treadmill's running at full speed. <laughs> You're absolutely correct. That wages are not keeping up with inflation. One thing that's been going on is that while the rate of inflation has been slowing, that doesn't mean that prices are coming down. That just means that that a rise in prices was 13, 14, 15 months ago, and is therefore not factored into the year-over-year statistics. And while it may be slowing just a little bit, Americans are still trying to make up for lost time. And and when we talk about uh, savings dwindling, I remember when the checks, you know, were coming, but really nobody was was going anywhere because so much of the country was shut down. Um, yeah, we were pretty good about uh, having our household savings built up. But uh, what exactly has happened in the meantime, I'm, I'm sure um, money that could be spent or that could be saved, rather, is being spent to, to keep up with, with just the cost of living. Is, are, are there any, is there anything officially being said about, uh, about what's happening to savings? There's not anything official, but what we have seen is that a lot of um, consumers are turning towards uh, a lot of debt to uh, ex- make their spending happen. We just got a new report today which showed that Americans' household debt is now at $17.5 trillion. Wow. I mean, you look at the national debt, and it's like, oh, well, that doesn't sound so... But when we're talking trillions, I mean, it's... Mm-hmm. Our minds, if you see a visual representation, you start to understand, oh, my gosh, that's a lot. Mm-hmm. So we're spending money we don't have yet. And uh, <laughs> is there ever a historical example of uh, people with that, that debt mindset that, that came out on top? I, I'm I'm racking my brain. I can't come up with one. There's very few instances where debt turns into a, po- a positive. Sure, you need debt to sustain an economy, to fund new innovations, but it's not sustainable in the long run. So what is uh, what exactly are we to make of the economic news that we're giving? I, I know 
whatever administration is in power, they're always going to try and spin it as favorably as possible. Well, you know, we're responsible for all of this. But who can we believe when it comes to understanding what's happening in the economy? Because it just seems like there are some self-serving sources out there, which uh, to me look like they may be part of the problem. I don't know if I can trust what they're telling me. Sure. So what we're seeing is a lot of the reports, the headlines numbers are very good. Last Friday, we saw 353,000 jobs added to the um, workforce, as well as a 3.7 unemployment rate. However, if you look down into the depths of that report, you actually see that there's a lot of more shady stuff going on inside of that. A lot of those jobs were in government, which have to be funded by taxpayers. And we also saw a continued there's a drop in the labor force participation rate, which is keeping that unemployment rate lower. Wow. So I, I want you to prognosticate for me, if, if you don't mind. Um, does, this, does this year look like we, we see at least a slowing of, of that effect of inflation? Or do, do we see, it, it, I, I want to be optimistic and believe things are going to you know, come back, the economy is going to rebound, but that, that, seems, that seems more like cope than not. Unfortunately, economics is all about trade-offs, and there's no solutions in economics, and that's the case here. As we're seeing this decline in consumer savings, consumers have two options. They can either go into further debt, or they can just accept the fact that they're not going to be able to sustain their current life, uh, uh, the way of their way of life. And as far as, as government spending, that doesn't seem to have slowed down much, but they're they're not spending on stimulus for the U.S. now. It seems like we're we're sending an awful lot of money out for uh, aid packages to this nation, that nation, and um, uh, again, it, it doesn't it doesn't feel like anybody, at least at the at the federal level, is doing anything that, that's going to change the trajectory that we're on. No, most people at the federal level are probably more concerned about their twenty twenty four election chances than they are about trying to come and uh, look at local local people and see what they're actually dealing with. So, what about the Federal Reserve? I mean. On the one hand, we're, we're told essentially, well, they control this, you know, through interest rates, uh, either rising, raising or lowering them, making easy money more accessible or less accessible. Um, are they really in control or is that just kind of an illusion that we buy into? The, the Federal Reserve does have a lot of control, but their policy instruments, which is the federal funds rate, is very blunt. And it also takes a long time for it to kick in. So it's very tricky for <laughs> trying to figure out how exactly the Federal Reserve actually impacts the economy, especially in the long term. And I guess in in your opinion, what would be the best thing for them to do? Obviously, quantitative easing was printing up and, and, uh, you know, making available trillions in, in, in money. If they, if they do that again, how, how, how would we see that manifest? Are we looking at, uh, you know, greatly increased inflation? Well, what we have in monetary policy is there's an idea called the Phillips curve, and it's basically this tug of war between unemployment and inflation. You can have one, you can have low employment and high inflation, or you can have low inflation and high unemployment. So really, the Fed has to decide, okay, how are we going to fight this? Are we going to deal with a lower or, or a high unemployment rate going into this 2024 election? Or are we going to have a higher inflation rate, which is going to hurt Americans in the long run? Wow, <laughs> I don't know whether I don't know whether to be uh, impressed that they have that kind of influence, or or maybe just a little bit uh, afraid of it. Probably afraid. <laughs> yeah, a little, little bit of both. Um, again, we are we're talking with Daniel Elmore. Daniel, when it comes to getting a good understanding of this, obviously monetary policy and and even economics can. can can get pretty uh, jargon heavy very quickly. What, what do you recommend for people trying to, to get a good basic understanding of the issue? The best thing that I ever did to learn economics was read Basic Economics by Thomas Sowell. Mm. It is the most simple pa- or simple book that I've ever read about economics, and it explains it in thorough detail. It's very long, but it's very worth it. Yeah, and, and Thomas Sowell... That that's a, that's a guy whose whose credentials you know he, he he knows what he's talking about. Well, very good. Look, I appreciate you taking the time to to visit with us today here on Moving Forward with Young Voices. Um, for the sake of our listeners, tell them where they can find you on social media. Tell them where they can follow uh, more of your writing. Sure. Uh, 
I've posted a decent amount on X, formerly Twitter, and that is at Daniel underscore J underscore Elmore. Okay, very good. Daniel, thank you so much for uh, for being my guest today. I look forward to talking with you down the road. Thank you very much. Welcome back to Moving Forward with Young Voices. Happy to welcome uh, William Rampe to the uh, program. He is a Young Voices contributor studying government at Hamilton College. And uh, William, first of all, welcome to the show. Tell us just a little bit more about uh, who you are and what you do. Hi, uh, thanks for having me, Brian. So yeah, to start, I've been a writer about um, foreign policy for the past few years. I've written for publications, but most recently, I've Reason Magazine. Um, I also spent some time with the uh, Council on Foreign Relations, and before that, I wrote for the Organization for World Peace. Um, the fo- topics I mainly focus on are, I would say, U.S. foreign policy, as I said, in grand strategy, specifically regarding um, the main, you know, players of the day: Iran, Russia, China. And then I also have an interest in uh, African politics, so I've written on numerous topics, you know, some domestic issues in Kenya, Nigeria, and other such nations in the past. Okay, that definitely makes you the big picture guy in this conversation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I'm I'm ax- mm-hmm. I'm actually really anxious to hear about uh, your take on this article from Real Clear World. Uh, the title mm-hmm. is "Continuing Aid to Ukraine Increases the Risk of Nuclear War," and I know that Ukraine has kind of disappeared from a lot of the the major U.S. Uh, news papers or the the news organizations. They 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 would have a complete dedicated you know page mm-hmm. for here's what's going on. Those have quietly mm-hmm. disappeared. Tell me a little bit about the, the situation in, in Ukraine, and then uh, let's talk about, I guess there's there's another pretty big aid package uh, that, that is being considered right now by Congress. Of course. So, yeah, I'll start with the first thing you mentioned. So, essentially, um, the, the narrative around Ukraine, despite it basically remaining the same since the start of the, start of the war, you know, obviously Russia, so the, Russia was outside Kiev, they were outside Kharkiv. So it was very... Uh, and, Ukraine's defense of those cities and of their territory was very heroic, and it, it still continues to be. And they made significant gains re- retaking their territory that many experts didn't really expect. So the narrative around Ukraine was always very positive. But however, despite it, I would say many in the media not shifting to the reality of the war, it's it's unfortunately become much more negative uh, since their uh, counteroffensive. You know, Russia was able to, with their heavy fortifications, their use of... Uh, minefields and now increasingly they're adopting to ukrainian drones um ukraine counteroffensive never really got going it was really bogged down by those defenses and leads us to the point of the war where we're at now where it's really i think could be best described as a, a stalemate with little gains from either sides you know there's towns and cities taken and whatnot but there's a, the territory gained is not much, but there's a lot of the casualties are very high. And there's a lot of obviously material that is, there's a lot of spending, there's a lot of material. Russia's economy shifted to war footing. So I would say right now the war is not going very well to for Ukraine. And just generally, um, as they've shifted to the offensive, it was already a tall task. And um, there was reporting from the summer saying that even U.S. officials had didn't really have confidence that they could succeed in this, but still went ahead with it anyway. Um, so there, it's become a, an issue of, I'd say, the moral legitimacy of Ukraine's cause, which I completely agree with and I'm on board with, with the realities of fighting a war against a much stronger superpower. So I guess I have to ask, is, is negotiation mm-hmm. the, the smarter way forward at this point? Uh, I, I would say yes, and that's, that, that's pretty much the, the crux of my article. Yeah, it, unfortunately, obviously... In an ideal world, Ukrainian army would be strong enough to retake Ulster, retake Crimea, retake the Donbass, and to really counter Russia. And I mean, give it enough of a shock to where Russia won't consider attacking Ukraine anytime in the near future. But that, unfortunately, is just not the case. And we have to, you know, we have to be cognizant in the facts on the ground. And so I, I've come to the conclusion based on, you know, interviewing interviews in the past, uh, talking to because I'm not a military expert, obviously, but just. Um, I talked to people, especially um, some senior fellows at the defense priorities who are obviously um, very knowledgeable about this topic. And the reality is that some type of ceasefire agreement makes sense if you if the goal, which I think for the 
United States should be, is to preserve Ukrainian statehood and to preserve their, you know, their democracy, their political system, even if it th- comes at, um, at least for the near future, the loss of uh, its claimed territory. Uh, William, some U.S. leaders almost seem to be um, pretty open about the idea that, look, this is a proxy war, you know, between the U.S. and Russia, um, just through the way that they're providing aid for for Ukraine. Talk to me about uh, the the whole U.S. Russian um, the impasse right now. Frankly, mm-hmm. this this to me, and and I'm I'm not I'm not you know well versed in in uh, foreign policy or or military history, but it seems like this was a dispute between Russia and Ukraine and, and the U.S really doesn't have a vital strategic interest there. And yet there they are, you know, front and center. And, and mm-hmm. with, with that involvement comes that increased risk of, of nuclear confrontation. Yeah, I, I think you put it very well there. Obviously, if you're looking at it from as, you know, many, uh, I, I guess, broadly a neoconservative, more interventionist perspective, yeah, it, we, the, the war is essentially a proxy war. And if your goal, uh, if you as the U.S., if your goal is to, to weaken Russia, and to do it any means possible, then yeah, sending sending as much aid as you can really is um, makes makes sense in that capacity. But I, I'm a libertarian. I believe in non-interventionism as the primary principle of should be should be the primary principle of foreign policy. And so I recognize, like, look, the, the aid. Besides, obviously, it's incredibly expensive and it hasn't worked. It, as I mentioned, article has, it didn't help in the counteroffensive and for to help. And this is still it's still doubtful how much more aid, if like the U.S. private how much more raid would have made the counteroffensive successful. But, um, yeah, I look at it that way and I say, well, this doesn't seem like the correct policy. And then obviously, as you mentioned at the time, my article suggests is that there is the, we have to take into account the fact that Russia is a nuclear power. Um, and they are very aware and they have, you know, they've waved the nuclear saber throughout this war, um, with, uh, quotes from numerous, multiple public officials. And, um, it seems to me that, while using nukes in Ukraine because of some of the, the blowback effects um, may not be the best policy for Russia, but certainly there is a, there's certainly a scenario where the war continues, it could escalate. And then from there, Russia could be, you know, could Putin could decide to use a nuke against NATO. And that's, that's a situation that the U S should be very wary of and recognize that, look, it's not like, it's not like giving more aid to Ukraine in this instance will make Russia use a nuke. But with the war continuing, it leads to potential for escalation. As I mentioned, there's Operation Steadfast Defender going now, which, um, as NATO declares, is very is, is one of the most um, unprecedented, unprecedented military, um, you know, defense drills by uh, the alliance. So that could that there's very high chance that at risk NATO really NATO um, the Russia's fear of NATO is part of the reason they invaded Ukraine in the first place. So you could see how. It, uh, it could start escalating from there and it comes out of control to where um, the, the nuclear option is on the table. I can, I can handle hard truths, mm-hmm. but there's some I'd really rather not face. <laughs> that's that's mm-hmm. one of the ones yeah. I'm just like, Oh man, it just, it just seems like the longer, um, not just the conflict itself drags on, but the, the longer that the U S is um, centrally involved in that conflict between Russia and Ukraine, the, the greater the likelihood that uh, either NATO is going to get dragged in or, um, mm-hmm. or there, you know, someone's going to get careless and, and pop off a nuke. And I, nobody wants, nobody wants to see things get to get that far off, off the, the skids, but wow, you know, mm-hmm. where, where are the cooler heads? <laughs> where can we find them? Hey, I mean, there's a lot, I mean, I'm, I'm just a writer on these topics. Obviously I talk to a lot of different people. There's a lot of, um, I'd say definitely at places like, like I mentioned, uh, Lyle Goldstein, who I referenced in my article at defense priorities, um, Daniel Davis, um, a lot of these, there's a lot of fellows out there. There's a lot of people writing about this who really have recognized that hey, the nuclear option is a real, it, it, we have not taken it seriously enough. You know, the counter argument to fearing about Russia is, oh, the U S has nukes. They, they wouldn't, you know, we're not a threat to another nuclear power. It's almost like they can cancel each other out, but you know, when you that, that doesn't really make sense when you take in the priority, the priorities of ter- different states, you know, and Putin, while, yes, there's a, there, we're not the same protests in the streets, you know, he's having trouble with the upcoming election. There's certainly still dissent in Russia. And he's, and as we saw from the Wagner mutiny only a year ago, you know, it's 
they're dealing with a lot of there's a lot of threats to uh, to Putin's power, and he could become desperate, especially in a, a conflict that. Really, I think it comes down to it, it, it means so much to Russia. It means a ton, so that we have to be very wary about dealing with um, Ukraine, by, because we have to recognize how important it is. You know, because of nationalistic purposes, all the rhetoric of Ukraine and Russia, the joint Soviet history, and also from you know security reasons, creating a, a deter, you know, uh, a buffer essentially against NATO. I wish we had more time, William just because I'd, I'd like to pick your brain a little bit about. So uh, Tucker Carlson apparently just had a chance to interview Putin, and I'd, I'd be most curious in, in your take on that. Unfortunately, we're down to like 30 seconds here. Um, tell people where they can find you on social media. Tell them where they can follow your writing. Of course. So I primarily post my writing on uh, X, as formerly known as Twitter, at, at, um, at WRAMPE7, um, W-R-A-M-P-E-7. And yeah, I'm, I'll be liking content there, posting all my articles. And um, yeah, so hopefully you can follow me. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for your time. Welcome back. This is our fourth and final segment of Moving Forward with Young Voices. Happy to welcome Susanna Barnes to the program. Susanna, welcome. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Take a moment and tell us just a little bit about uh, yourself. Hi, yeah. So I am a program manager for fiscal policy at a think tank out in D.C. Uh, so I work on various issues related to government spending, taxation, and then I do a little bit of issues related to gender and family policy. Uh, and I recently graduated with my master's. Well, not so recent now. It was last May, but uh, in the past year, which was really exciting. Well, congratulations. Now, Thank you so much. I'm looking at an article you wrote for The Hill about uh, how expanding the child tax credit won't actually help poor children. And I'll admit, my wife is the brains of our outfit, so she does our taxes. She's really she's yeah. a math teacher, so she's really good with that stuff. Talk to me about the child tax credit. I know during COVID, there were some, some adjustments that were made. What was the nature of those adjustments? Yeah, so the expansion tweaked a few things. So it broadened access and increased the refundable credit, and it added a few inflation adjustments. Uh, so... In this particular expansion that we're seeing proposed today, it changed the maximum credit from 1600 to 2000 by 2025. So it would be an incremental increase of $400. And the child tax credit is a break for moderate to low-income families to help them with the cost of raising a child. Now, this was done with the American Rescue Plan, of course, to offset those additional child care costs that may be from that families were incurring from having children at home when they were in school, uh, which seemed like a great policy at the time. And now bipartisan groups are hoping to make that policy permanent. And that did pass the House very recently. Okay. So, but you, you point out in your article by making this permanent, they're actually taking a pretty short sighted approach to um, fighting poverty uh, among children. Tell me, what are they overlooking? Yeah. So the, Biggest thing that they're overlooking is intergenerational mobility. It's true that the child tax credit would reduce the number of children in poverty, but research demonstrates that this reduction in of number of children in poverty doesn't lead to a reduction of number of adults in uh, that are low income. Now, this is important to look at because we are when we're thinking about policy and when we're thinking about welfare. We should be hoping to see people who are in higher income brackets than their parents, who are achieving a higher level of education than their parents, having better jobs than their parents. Because what that means is that our policies are resulting in people having better lives. And our current welfare system has reduced child poverty, but the data doesn't show an accompanying change in intergenerational mobility. Now, we didn't see this with the American Rescue Plan because it was instituted in response to an economic shock, and then it was taken away. So we saw those short-term effects of reduced child poverty, but we didn't see what would happen over the long term. So what Congress is hoping to do is to institute a policy that looked really good in the short term, but didn't have those positive long-term effects that are really important for welfare policies. I like how you point out, too, that, uh, you know, by making that expansion permanent, they're, they're actually reducing incentives for parents to work and, and to marry. And 
I know some people think, well, you know, that's not the intent of the, of, you know, of why they do this, but you got to look at the unintended consequences or, or things that may happen that you didn't count on. And that, that certainly would be one of them. Yeah, definitely. And I think especially with work and marriage, a lot of times we discredit how important both of those are to lifting children out of poverty. Uh, Work especially has been shown to, if your parent is working, to reduce the likelihood that you will be in poverty. Uh, Even just a parent working a few more weeks out of the year uh, dramatically increases the likelihood that they will be above the poverty line and that they will not fall back underneath it and that children will not see themselves under the poverty line as adults. So that's just one example that we see in the literature or that I've seen in the literature that has shown the importance of parents working for long-term economic growth for these children. And same with marriage. There's a great disparity in how children of a married couple uh, play out in the long-term. Marriage results in better educational outcomes. Their children of a married couple are far less likely to fall victim to criminal activity. So there's lots of benefits that we discredit. And so creating policies that incentivize work and marriage, or at the very least don't disincentivize work and marriage, is critically important. Yep. The old saying, tax what you want to punish and subsidize what you want to encourage. Yes, exactly. Seems like that would apply. (laughs) So are are there any... Is there anybody who who's recommending some things that that actually would would look more effective, especially as as we look at long term, like you pointed out, you know, beyond just you know the the childhood of of the individual in poverty, but to, towards their adulthood? Do you see someone who's who's making sense on that front? A lot of these policies are kind of out of the norm. I people look towards welfare, people look towards tax breaks, which makes a lot of sense. Those seem to be an exact match for the needs that people have. But a lot of the policies that we could be looking at are economic or labor policies, Uh, but it's also non-government action. So a few examples might be ways to get people into those jobs that I was talking about. Now, government action that that could look like is helping low-income families get into skilled trade jobs. It is true that it's difficult for a lot of low-income people to access education, and that's really unfortunate. And skilled trade jobs are a great alternative, and we need people in those trades. But occupational licensing is one thing that is a really big burden and a really huge hurdle to people getting into those jobs. So this seems like kind of an unintuitive policy that could help with reducing poverty, but it's a really big hurdle that exists. But outside of government, we also could see employers helping with flexible work arrangements, remote work, and even design your day programs where you can say, I'm going to come in at 10 or I'm going to come in or leave work earlier are really beneficial for especially single mothers. And that's one thing that employers can do to help make sure that families can find jobs that work for them and work for their families. Uh, And then, of course, there's other institutions and communities like churches or nonprofit groups that can help provide child care. I think we look towards government first, uh, which makes sense, but that's not the only institution. And so we should think about what other actors can do to help reduce child poverty. Wow. you, You make a lot of sense. You need to get the ear of some of these uh, policymakers. <laughs> no, I hope so. <laughs> I, I I think about what what you point out about how um, you know expanding the child tax credit maybe provides a little bit of help, but it's a very short term help that really does nothing in in the long term. Um, and it seems like as as I hear you describe some of the especially some of the non government solutions, I wish we heard more about government getting out of the way you know, insofar as it was able, you, your mention of occupational licensing, perfect example. You know, there, there are plenty of people who would love to work, but if there are barriers that exist to entering the marketplace, you know, and sometimes licensure is, is one of those things. Yeah. And licensures can be very expensive too. Um, and that's just another hurdle that low income families face. And it might be something a lot of times we fall into this trap of saying, oh, they just don't want to work or right. they aren't looking for a job. And that is very rarely the case. There are so many hurdles to getting jobs, especially if you lack a bachelor's degree for whatever reason that may be, uh, whether you had a child or you couldn't afford education. So what can we do to make sure that there's jobs available? Uh, and again, licensing, it's a great way to do that. 
Okay. Licensing reform. We've got uh, got just a little over a minute left. Let's let's talk about uh, what do you see on the horizon that looks encouraging, either in terms of uh, of tax policy or just in terms of, of federal policy. I, I know it's easy to get fixated on the the negative. I probably spend more time looking at hey, that's not supposed to happen. But what do you see that gives you some encouragement? I think one thing that's encouraging is people are talking about the costs and benefits of this policy. When it went through the House, people were kind of pushed it through really quickly, but people are really weighing what this looks like when it goes to the Senate. It doesn't seem like there's as much of a rush with the passage to the Senate. They're waiting until around March to bring this up for a decision and are talking about things like work requirements, uh, which may be a way to make sure that we don't see these disemployment effects. And that's something that's really encouraging to me. I don't know what that will look like, and I don't really give recommendations on how to craft policy like that, but that is something that makes me feel encouraged about the future of tax policy like this. Again, we are talking with Susanna Barnes. She is a Young Voices contributor and also a fiscal policy manager in the D.C. metro area. Um, where can people find you on social media? I, I'm on Twitter at Susanna E. Barnes, uh, and that is the best place to find me. Okay. And, and are there other outlets where they can find your writing as well? I've been in National Review, uh, Forbes, and Real Clear Policy as well. Very nice. Susanna, great to visit with you. I look forward to our next conversation. Great. Thank you so much.